Welcome to another eddycurrent.com podcast, and today we will be talking about the demystification of the impedance plane. So to understand the impedance plane, and put it in more simple terms, you need to understand a little bit about Dr. Forrester's vector point analysis. Vector point analysis was the predecessor to modern day phase analysis, and it consisted of looking at where the impedance trace, or the tip of that little vector, you see in all those vector diagrams, the little arrow on the end. He was paying attention to where that little vector tip moved on his screen. And as you may know from your studies that Dr. Forrester did a lot of work with encircling coils. And you know, he, he did things a unique way. Instead of using encircling coils like we know of today, where a big fixed coil and you stick a product through the middle of it, he actually used liquid metal, in other words, mercury, and he would take these little grabbers and he'd put little pieces of plastic and non-conductive materials in there. That's how he would create these voids inside of solid structures. It was inside of liquid mercury. And what he would do was he would notice where the vector point moved and he would plot that on an impedance plane. So we're gonna take a look at some of the impedance plane diagrams that you see in many of, especially the older textbooks. And we're gonna talk about why we still use them. They were actually good training tools because, you know, back in the day, not everybody had test instrument. And now because the technology is advanced and, you know, I wouldn't say they got much cheaper, but test instruments are much more accessible these days. They're much more portable. And it's a lot easier to actually sit down with the tester and play around with it. And, you know, if you're an instructor, you can show your student well, how the impedance vector moves for different test material properties. But back in the day, they couldn't do that. It was just too difficult and expensive. So they used impedance plane diagrams. And many of the impedance plane diagrams you see are computer modeled. Uh, people don't usually sit down and draw those things out, although I could sketch one out and say, hey, you know, if the fill factor changes, this is where your vector tip moves. So they're training tools. That's all they are, is it used to be an easy way to show people what happened with the squiggles. When I used to look at impedance plane diagrams, I mean, I understood that they were talking about vector points and you know different phases and separation angles and amplitudes. But I always wondered, how come you never see any differential signals on an impedance plane? And I'm sure if I was wondering that, there's probably other people that have also wondered that. The test instrument that you're using, probably, when you're doing eddy current testing, is nothing more than an impedance plane. And when you use the phase control or the rotate control, you're just turning that whole impedance plane on its axis. Now, when you look on impedance plane diagrams, you know, XL is on the left and you got resistance on the horizontal axis. But you know, inductive reactance is going straight up. Actually, if you set noise horizontal, what that does is it tilts the XL of the inductive reactance axis about 40 degrees counterclockwise. That puts your noise, you know, of course you'll get a little curvature if you're making conductivity curves or whatever but it'll put them sort of on the horizontal axis. And if you think about impedance planes that way, you can sort of visualize your test instrument when you're playing around, you know, with your conductivity blocks. And yes, you always set the unloaded coil or the air point in the upper left-hand corner. And as you touch the different materials on your conductivity block, the more conductive they get, you know, they move down clockwise along the curve. If you go and scan less conductive materials, they're gonna go counterclockwise towards the unloaded coil point. When impedance planes are used as tools to explain what happens to signals, their intention isn't to show you what the signal looks like. The intent is to show you how test coil impedance will change for different conditions. And a signal is a series of the changing impedance values. So think back to the vector points, if you were to connect all those dots, you'd have a pretty squirrely looking signal. But you need all the individual impedance points to make a signal. Now, if you have a absolute surface coil, like in a pencil probe, you know what an absolute signal looks like from a surface break notch? Kind of curves up and to the left and it comes back. That's maybe a series of a few hundred impedance points, all connected by vectors. So your test instrument is really just it's kind of like an electronic chalkboard and it just displays the path that the individual impedance points are taking. It's not the intent to, to draw differential signals on an impedance plane, but the impedance plane could help you explain what happens for 
a change in geometry or what happens for thinning of a material and your signal shape and size and phase that's all going to be very dependent on your coil design so that's why you don't you don't usually see like differential signals on the impedance plane that's not their intent but if you just imagine the impedance plane as how the changing electrical properties of the coil affect your impedance trace that's moving all over your screen that'll give you a fundamental understanding of you know why and how that vector point moves around push the impedance planes aside and just sit down with the tester rotate your noise horizontal so your inductive reactance is over like a you know minus 40 degrees angle from from vertical just start playing around with your probe you know take your surface probe and lift it up get increased lift off and bring it back down and watch your impedance point move or your vector or your impedance trajectory or your eddy current squiggles, whatever you want to call it. But that's moving all around the impedance plane, and you're making it happen by moving the probe and scanning the material. Another thing that's complicated about vector diagrams is that if you've taken math and trigonometry and calculus and physics and all that stuff, the zero reference point is usually on the right-hand side of the graphic. And phase angles increase counterclockwise. 90 degrees is vertical. But on most modern eddy current test instruments, it's reversed. The zero is on the left and 180 is on the right. That perplexed me for many years. I'm like, where's the connection here? Where's the connection here? But if you look in AST's NDT handbook, I forget which chapter it is, but former Z Tech training manager, Jim Cox, put a little chapter in there and it's kind of hidden. You got to dig for it. If you got the electronic copy, you can search for it. But that's really an artifact of old legacy systems and around the 1980s, when the EM3300 and the MIS-12 came into the marketplace, and those founders like Clyde Denton were coming to the decision point when they had to choose where they want the zero and where they want the 180, they had to pick something that in their minds made the most sense. And knowing where ID flaws exist in the flaw plane and where OD flaws exist in the flaw plane, and where most of your flaws occur, at least at the time, probably on the OD of the tube, that's where you need the most phase spread. It probably made more sense to put the zero on the left, but that was a conscious decision made by the early instrument manufacturers to flip it. So next time you're looking at an impedance plane and see zero on the right, you'll know that the old school eddy current guys are the ones that changed that reference point.